It, it, it can be. I mean, you know, you, we see a lot of things. Um, how many of you have seen Making of a Murderer? You know, it's a, it's a series on, on Netflix. And it's an interesting series because, like, I don't know if you, you listen to the, uh, the uh, audio. Uh, it's called Serial. Uh, but it kind of takes you back and forth, like, you know, you know, is he guilty? Is he innocent? And, and even as a defense attorney, I mean, you go through a lot of that, too, because people always say, well, don't you know whether they're innocent or not? Well, you don't always know. And sometimes you have clients who are charged with one thing, and really they did something else. And that's very common. And because when you're charged with a crime, most people don't realize this. They will charge you with the most serious thing. So maybe you got into a bar fight, and yeah, maybe you committed an assault. But then you're charged with assault with a deadly weapon, and suddenly you're looking at four years in state prison, plus great bodily injury, which is another three years. You can go to prison for seven years. You're like, hey, I got into a bar fight, I thought I might get 30 days in jail. I didn't think I was going to get seven years. And, you know, it, it is insane, you know, the, the way the system works. And you often don't see that until you're in it. And so most people really don't understand why it's important to have a fair criminal justice system until they have a, sometimes it's a child uh, that, that gets involved in the system or, you know, a brother, sister, or a friend, or even yourself. And then you realize uh, that it's a very different uh, reality because you're taken to court, uh, you're going to be presumed to be guilty, you'll be dressed in orange, the judge is going to look at you and figure out how much money uh, will keep you in jail, right? Because it's a bail system. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're Bernie Madoff uh, and you have the money to post your bail, you will be out no matter what you did, you know. Whereas if you're in jail for, um, you know, driving with a suspended license and you can't afford the $10,000 bail, you'll be in jail until your case is heard, which can take 30 to 45 days. So aren't you um, pursuing an initiative to redress the inequality of bail that seems mm. kind of arbitrary? Well, I shouldn't say kind of arbitrary, but, but the number gets set, and your office <coughs> is, 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 and also the district mm -hmm. attorney's office. So you have two different programs going, right? where you're trying to mm -hmm. set bail that is more appropriate depending on the person's character and, and right. their, their chance of jumping bail. or Is that accurate? Yeah, the way the bail system works is that if you have the money, so if, if you have a, a nice house and you have uh, cash in the bank, uh, you can put that money up uh, for your bail. So if they, uh, your bail is $200,000, you can put that money up and then you'll get it back afterwards, all fine. If you don't have the money, then you have to go to a bail bonds person who will post it for you, but they will charge you 10%. So you'll put up $20,000 and you can pay it on an installment payment or anything else uh, and until you pay it all back, but you'll be $20,000 in debt. So let's say you get charged with a crime and you don't have the $200,000, so you put up $20,000 and you go to court on your first court appearance and it's dismissed. Mm -hmm. What happens? Do you get the $20,000 back? No, that's, that's gone. Let's say you're in jail on a felony case and you're charged with a serious crime. We just had a case like this the other day and you're in jail for eight months awaiting your trial and then you're found not guilty. Well, do you get that time back? No. You know, you're, you know that, that time is dead time. So what? You lost your job. You lost your family. You know? and, and that's the thing about the bail system. Uh, the United States is only one of two countries. I don't know if you can guess the other country. Uh, that allows an industry to make money off of bail. The other country is the Philippines. And in, in, in most other places, they'll use uh, other criteria to determine whether or not you should be released. They'll look at you know, whether you've showed up to court in the past, you know, what your record is, all those kinds of things. But in the United States, it's all based on the amount of money that you have. So we've been involved in efforts. We have a very progressive district attorney in San Francisco, George Gascona, we've actually worked together on trying to reform the bail system. So we brought in a new system now where they use an algorithm. It's not perfect to figure out, you know, when a person should be released, and they use that for low-level crimes. But unfortunately, it's still based on a bail system. So when you hear that people are presumed innocent, uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to be released, you know, and that's sort of the the contradiction in our in our system. And depending on who you get, I mean. There are some judges in the same case that would set your bail two to three times higher, right? Because they're more conservative in their orientation. Um, 
every county has their own bail schedule. Bail schedule means a default schedule that the judges will rely upon. And so if you get busted for drugs, you know, in Ventura County, your bail might be 1500 in San Francisco, it'll be 25000 And so, you know, there's really no what? checks and balances. So, you know, your, your bail can be sometimes 10 times more depending where you're arrested. And it's an odd thing because if you go to San Mateo, oh, I just saw a raccoon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure it wasn't a squirrel? <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, that's, that's exactly true. <laughs> Um, we don't have those in Redirect. San Francisco. Oh, I guess we do. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it, it's a system that, that does need, need to be changed. So we actually have a lawsuit that we f have filed in conjunction with another group that comes in and, and does these suits in federal court claiming that the bail system is unconstitutional. So we'll see what happens. But there are a lot of reforms that are going on now, um, which to me is re really refreshing to see that, uh, you know, it, most of you have probably heard of the Black Lives Matters movement and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the police shootings that have made, uh, been made possible through uh, the handheld cameras that people have. Um, and it, it really has had an effect in terms of changing policy, attitudes, law, and hopefully the system. Mm -hmm. So you're an advocate for police cameras as part of the uniform? Yeah, I, I have been. I was just at a National uh, Defense Attorneys Conference in, in Florida last week, and we were debating it. Because some people, defense attorneys, are saying it's going to make it worse for us to have body cameras because then you're going to see all the terrible things that people do, right? Do you really want to see your client at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, sprawl out on the street uh, when, when she's charged with being drunk in public or whatever? Um, you know, but I, I do think it's a good thing uh, mm -hmm. that uh, transparency, uh, you know, brings, you know, greater accountability. Uh, and, and almost every... A police force that has used body cameras. I mean, think about it. Would you want a body camera following you around wherever you went? Probably not. Yeah. But police officers, they're, they're in a position of power. You know, they can make these decisions that result in a person being freed or, or, or jailed. Uh, they can pull the trigger and, you know, decide to, uh, hello. Uh, Hi. <laughs>
uh, that was reportedly stolen. She tried to get away from the police, and a police a, a sergeant shot her to death. And that resulted uh, in part in, in calls for the police chief to resign, and, and he did. Um, but you know, people are fed up, you know, with these these what what they see are justified shootings, and whether it's Eric Gardner, to Mira Rice, Claude McDonald, um, you know, so many cases. Uh, I had an opportunity, you know, last week uh, in Florida to meet with the uh, parents. Uh, I don't know if you remember a young man named Jordan who was killed uh, in um, in Florida, and and you know, you see the devastation that it causes in these families, and you know, it's hard to imagine, you know, that you could be you know, selling cigarettes on the street like Eric Gardner. You know, of course, you would say, I wouldn't be selling cigarettes on the streets. I never would have been in that situation in the first place. And then, you know, to wind up dead. You know, how does that happen, you know, in, in our country? So uh, one of the questions that I had, and I'm going to jump it into it right now because of what you just said, you ran for mayor, and I know mm -hmm. the platform upon which you ran, but if you were mayor today and <laughs> we're talking about this mm -hmm. police shootings and so forth, is there anything that, that you would do differently or you would like to see happen to help? Well, I mean, the, the mayor, you know, who's Ed Lee, mm -hmm. I think uh, is, is doing what he feels he needs to do in order to, you know, sort of appease the unrest. I mean, you had uh, the Frisco Five, the hunger strikes, you had, you know, protests going on in the street. Um, and, you know, this, this call for police reform in San Francisco, you know, we had the, uh, the release of these racist texts and mm -hmm. that actually came about because of an investigation that was started by our office. You know, we had learned that there were police officers who were breaking into people's rooms uh, without a warrant at this hotel called the Henry Hotel, which is a hotel where there's a lot of drug activity uh, in San Francisco. It's a hotel on, on, uh, on 6th Street. And our clients were coming to court saying, hey, the cops are like bursting into, into our, you know, our rooms without warrants and uh, arresting us. And so we sent an investigator down to the hotel. It turned out that they had a very sophisticated surveillance uh, camera system there, HD. And so <laughs> we downloaded a year and a half worth of video. And we compared it to about a dozen uh, arrest reports. And in every case, it showed that the police were lying. That they would say, oh, we knocked on Susie's door, and Susie said, come on in. And we found the drugs on her dresser, and we arrested her. Well, you look at the video, and it showed the police just barging into a room, or sometimes using a pass key that they had gotten from the clerk. One of the videos showed the officer putting his hand over the camera, you know, hiding what they were doing, and then he withdrew it right as they were barging into uh, uh, a person's room. And so we had this evidence. <coughs> And I knew that if I just gave it to the police department, I'd never hear about it again. And so we held a series of press conferences, and, you know, it was on CNN by the weekend. And, uh, uh, you know, we held, I think, five police conference, I mean, press conferences because we had this video. And uh, another thing that we discovered <clears throat> is that it appeared that, well, our clients were saying that there was stuff missing from their room. There was, like, one of their kids had a piggy bank with all these, you know, uh, dollars in it that they were saving and then it was gone and it was little things like uh, like an iPod and things like that well they had initially thought that there were people in the hotel that had gone into the room afterward and stolen it but then we watched the videos and we saw the police leaving the room with bags of property and so it turned out that the police were, were stealing so when we had a press conference and and, and released this information uh, the feds came in and they prosecuted him, and five cops ended up getting convicted. Well, one of the cops turned state's evidence and testified against the other cops. And I didn't even know this, uh, maybe some of you do, but in San Francisco they have an Uber service, and maybe I shouldn't say this, that delivers drugs, yeah, just like Uber, <laughs> right? And so the cops were, were uh, found out you know, who the drivers were, and they were shaking them down. And in one case they found out where the money was, and they went to the house and they stole $30,000 in cash. And so I mean, this is right out of like the movies or something, but this is happening okay. in San Francisco. And so as a result, they got convicted. Well, as, as a result of that, one of the f cell phones of the officers was, uh, you know, was seized by the police and they found all these racist texts where they talk about burning crosses and killing children and KKK. 
And it was just pretty wild stuff, and it kind of gave an insight. So the mayor was confronted, you know, with all of that, and for a long time, you know, he didn't do much. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as, as public defender, I really felt that we needed to, to focus on those issues. And, you know, so that's one of the issues I talked about, you know, when I, when I ran for, for mayor. Um, you know, not to say that criminal justice reform is the only issue. I mean, schools, there were so many other issues that concern housing in San Francisco. But uh, one thing that I was very proud to be a part of is that effort to try and root out that kind of corruption. And not to say that out of the 2,000 police officers in San Francisco, all of them engage in misconduct. But I think there is a culture, mm -hmm. you know, where that is allowed, and, and it shouldn't be, yeah. because it really sends the wrong message to citizens. And it also deprives, you know, people who really want to be good police officers from being able to do uh, their job. So depending on who you talk to, I am very popular or unpopular for taking a stance on some of those issues.